Welcome everyone to the EED webinar on June 10th and our theme today is the unnatural nature of forgiveness and I've chosen that title very 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 carefully because what I'm about to show you is the victim persecutor cycle and uh, how forgiveness works in order for us to dissolve the cycle as opposed to continually perpetuate it. Um, what I'm putting forward is that it is natural to keep perpetuating the cycle because we always want to balance each side with each other. And um, it is unnatural to uh, leave something feeling unbalanced. And so it's, it's very, there's a very strong pull to keep wanting to retaliate and exact revenge. Uh, and in order to fully let the cycle go, somebody makes a sacrifice. And uh, that's not very happy news for most people. So <laughs> I'm expecting that what I'm gonna put forward will make logical sense, but it may feel completely wrong. And it might feel completely unnatural. And if it's feeling unnatural, it's good. So we can have a good rich discussion here on everything that I'm presenting. Uh, feel free to agree and disagree. Feel free to like and not like what I'm putting forward. Can we, can we push forgiveness to the as a person without sacrificing ourselves and still be good? What do you think, Paul? <laughs> Please? <laughs> wouldn't that be easy? That would, wouldn't that just be so easy? Right? Like, what, we're, what, what I'm hoping that you'll get out of this is a, more of an understanding why it's so difficult to forgive and why every time we do forgive, we feel like we just got screwed over. Okay? Uh. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. So that maybe we could start to have more compassion for ourselves and for each other. And uh, one of the messages I want to give at the end is please do not rush into forgiveness, no matter how much pressure you feel, because there's pressure coming from all around to understand and to forgive and let live and to let go. And uh, I, I'm going to show you why it's not so easy. Okay. And it's really relevant for today because there's so much stuff going on around identity politics, around, you know, m m minorities, equality, diversity, all of these things. And what, it's really, what it really is, is a classic phase of the victim persecutor cycle. And everything that's happening right now is all natural. It just feels really uncomfortable. And I'm hoping that we can create more understanding and more comfort to move through this without making some snap judgment choices that might trap us into repeating the cycle. How does this sound? Sounds better. <laughs> yeah? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what might, what I, might help you too I, is take a little bit of distance from this and not take everything too, 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 too personally, but put it up on a movie screen, all right? So that you have some detachment as you listen to the information. Allow yourself to be affected, but again, move into some detachment as well. And Yusuf, you were trying to say something there. Uh, yeah, so forgiveness between two parties, and under, I understand this dynamic and what you're talking about, but uh, what's, it's, my, my, it's my relation between me. It's like, okay, this is, you know what I mean? It's forgiveness yeah, of, yeah. of oneself, and, and not that to- That comes into it, yes. That it's not only forgiveness of each other, one party to the other, both ways. It is also forgiveness of self on both sides, that both sides are forgiving themselves as well. So I'm, and towards the end, I'm gonna give you the phases of this cycle and that there are stopping points. We, we cannot proceed until something is done. We cannot proceed until something is done. And there are several stages to go through in order for the cycle to completely dissolve, okay, of a particular conflict, all right? Okay, there's my introduction. <laughs> So in brief, what are we discovering? We're gonna get an overview of the victim persecutor cycle and we're gonna show you how each role is actually a shadow of each other and what binds them together, all right? Uh, they each want something from each other and there's reasons why they're both repelled by each other. And there are reasons why they're both attracted to each other and trapped with each other, all right? So, uh, once we understand how they're bound together, we can start to understand how to untangle them, all right? Um, 
as we go through this, we're going to look at simple guidelines for cultivating resilience and humility. And this is resilience and humility on both sides so that we are able to begin the work of reconciling our roles in the cycle. And what I'm going to say right up front is we embody both roles. We will favor one role over the other. We will experience one role over the other. But as you will see, we are actually embodying both roles. Okay. And for some of you, you might think, how can that happen? Well, suspend that question for a while. I'm going to ask. Okay. Um, and then we're going to look at tips for understanding the nature of revenge, why it's there and why it's so easy and tempting and how to neutralize the urge to continually perpetuate the cycle when we are at a crossroads of justice, of exacting justice, and we have the opportunity to make a bid for forgiveness or to accept the forgiveness that somebody asks. So we're, when there is, when we, in, in the reconciliation cycle, we'll always hit a crossroads, always a juncture. Do we accept? Do we forgive? Do we exact revenge? Do we uh, enact justice? Like, how do we balance this? Okay, because there's some misperceptions that if I'm forgiving you, then I'm letting go of holding you accountable. There's a misperception that if, um, if I proceed with justice, that somehow, uh, the, like, that somehow um, I can't forgive right? Or that I need revenge in order to make justice possible. And that can just be persecution all over again. Just the tables have turned, all right? So it's very tricky territory to, to uh, walk through. Uh, any comments or questions here? And by the way, feel free to comment and question at any time. Just unmute and interrupt, all right? Comments, questions here, or thoughts that come up as you see what we're looking at. If not, give me a thumbs up and then I'm suspicious because it's just too easy. So we are looking at a meta guideline on how the cycle works and we can apply this for different scenarios. Yes, and I want you to look at this on a meta level. I am not going to dive into say racism and say, you know, when are we gonna reconcile blacks and whites together? And not only that, but all races. Um, you can certainly apply it. But what we're looking at is the grand meta dynamic of victim and persecutor. This can, this can be religious issues. This can be race issues. This can be gender issues. This can be sexuality issues. This can be parental issues, family, generations. It all applies. This is all about oppressing and being oppressed. Okay. This is about the quest for, for power, the quest for recognition, validation, love, connection, and ultimately for unity and fairness and equality, okay? This, these are universal concepts, all right? And they'll, they'll play themselves, the same dynamic will play itself under many, many different um, uh, identities, uh, disguises, roles, games, scenarios, situations, all right? So this is, yeah, a meta template, so to speak, all right? So if your questions come in and say, well, how is this applying to what's going on today, here or there or anywhere? Yeah, it's fine. And we're, but we're, gonna, we're not gonna um, go into the issues. We're gonna look at it from the dynamics perspective. If there's anything you get out of this, I'm hoping you can see the victim persecutor as a drama, as a, a, as a playing out of theater for us to learn something from. And that might sound perhaps not compassionate, but if you're able to look at everything like that as a theater game, yes, it's personal. Yes, it hurts. Yes, we're affected. But when we start detaching our identity or our, our identification with the game, we actually can see more deeply what's going on and how both sides function together. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Okay, great. And I'm, I'm not just saying that for people attending because most of you have seen these webinars before, you've attended some of the courses. I'm also saying it for those listening to the recording and may have not discovered EED ever before. And this might be the first time that they're, they're looking at EED. So 
Speaking of which, what is EED, Emergent Essence Dynamics? What does it do? I know those of you attending live already are familiar with this. Again, it's for the sake of those listening to the recording as well. Um, we're working with relationship patterns. Everything is in relationship with each other and all relationships are following a pattern. They go through cycles. Those cycles are fractal, meaning the same pattern is working at the smallest scale to the largest scale, all right? And it, um, even though it looks like there may be a lot of complexity, that complexity can be reduced to a simple pattern that repeats upon itself. And it is the pattern that drives the relationship. Which when you say smallest and largest level, the same pattern, you mean it is the same set of stories or the same set of chapters? Same dynamics. Dynamics and chapters, yeah. And the One details same. may be different, but the patterns are the same. Yeah, so when we have a specific case, something specific, it means that in the same case, we will dissolve the cycle once, but for the same case, we will not have the end of the fractal pattern. Well, if, if, we're, dis if we're actually going into the full reconciliation and, and dissolution, dissolving of the pattern, it's going to be affected everywhere if it's a genuine and complete dis, uh, uh, reconciliation and dissolving, which means that if we take a particular relationship game that we're working with, we're recognizing the core pattern, we uncover it, and we're able to learn the lesson from the pattern. Mm -hmm. Every pattern is presenting a lesson that we can learn, which is gonna cultivate a new strength in ourselves, a new awareness, okay? Mm -hmm. When we're able to integrate that, then the, and, and, um, we've learned the lesson, there's no need for the pattern, therefore the pattern is not going to manifest. And other scenarios as well. That's right. It's oh. going to shift all relationships. Yeah. So if I'm working on a relationship with my best friend and that pattern is happening with my best friend, it's happening with my mother, it's happening with my boss, right? it's going to shift all the relationships once I'm reconciling the pattern. Okay. It's not because they change. It's because Mm -hmm. I change, okay, and I'm collapsing the pattern. Right. So the, okay. So the, so the pattern goes through different relationships. And that's yeah. How, all right. And if ever I go through my life and I meet that pattern again, I'll have a choice if I engage with it or not. I could still engage, but I'm now far more informed of how to behave in the pattern and not to get hooked by it. Okay. So I could actually deauthorize that game, or I could choose to play in it. All right. But until we reconcile the pattern, we're always going to be baited and hooked in, whether we like it or not, whether it's conscious or unconscious, okay? So by going through the reconciliation process, we're able to begin to start unhooking. Um, Benjamin, yeah, welcome. Well, hi. So I wonder what does keep me in the current pattern? That's exactly what I'm going to show you. <laughs> that's the big question okay so let's hold that okay because uh, that we're, we're gonna get to that on the very next sign, uh, slide okay uh so immersion essence dynamics is working with our human dynamics and those patterns that drive us okay and you can use this in coaching leadership mediation facilitation your personal life it, it happens everywhere because we're in relationship everywhere with everything the main thing we're doing here which is different let's say from what we see normally is we're, we're not trying to transform anything. We're not trying to change those patterns immediately. We first want to build resilience first within ourselves, within the relationship before we change anything. Then we want to reveal the pattern, let the pattern play out. And it takes resilience to allow the pattern to, to play out without changing it. Then we can start shifting the, the root pattern, that core fractal, in the resilient space. The resilience allows the fluidity to shift. If we're not resilient, we will not allow the shift, okay? And I'll show you why in the next slide. We have four levels of relationship. We have me and myself that, with my story. This is, this is me, okay? This is me and this is you and we're in a game of opposition. So. I'm coming from a level of identity. This is my point of view. This is my experience of the world, my experience of life. You're going to come from your identity, which is your experience of the world, your story, your point of view. And we're each going to enter with a different truth. My truth, your truth. We're each going to enter a game 
of opposites where we play a role with each other. That could be mother and son. It could also be victim and persecutor. All right. It could be cat and mouse. And in the game, we're, we have two opposing truths, two opposing worldviews. Maybe we agree and we get along, but, um, but we can also disagree and not get along. And it is that disagreement of the worldviews or of the two story bubbles uh, where we try to conquer each other. We're try I'm trying to pull you into my world, you're trying to pull me, into, pull, pull me into yours, okay? That's the truth in opposition. This is where we get the conflict. It's on this level of game. Now, that's two opposites in opposition. Now, when we can be more fluid, more resilient, we're able to actually open that bubble a little more and be, put our awareness over there on the true person, not our perception of the person, experience the other person and allow them to influence us. Okay, this is the key to opening the bubble is put your awareness over there on them without projecting and allow yourself to be influenced. That is very vulnerable and it takes resilience to do it, to allow something in because up here that feels very threatening. Here when you're resilient, it's less threatening because you know there's a permanent timeless aspect of yourself that is actually quite invincible. Therefore, you can afford to be more open, all right? This is where we can begin building resilience in relationship, where the identities are less rigid and they're able to cross influence and they realize that they're complementary. So this is where dark and light work together, okay? This is where good and evil work together okay hot and cold work together to create a larger range of experience and they actually co-define each other you cannot have a victim without a persecutor you cannot have a persecutor without a victim okay in game level it all feels unfair but on dream level we realize oh we're both working together to create a larger experience and learn something larger about ourselves in general okay um i'm noticing soul you you put up your hand maybe or something um you can always put something in the chat or just unmute and speak um uh and then where does reconciliation take place it's going to take place at the level of source where there is unified truth this is where paradox is reconciled okay hot and cold can be can simultaneously exist all right um this is where we've let go of identity Okay, and we're, we're, we're doing the reconciliation on a level of essence to essence, all right? Um, and I'll show you why it's important to get beyond identity in, in order to begin reconciliation, uh, because we need to actually drop our roles. We can recognize our roles, but we need to drop them because the role is gonna wanna cling to that game. And in a reconciliation process and in the final phase of forgiveness, we're dissolving not only the game, but we're dissolving the identity. It's getting reabsorbed back into the essence of all potential. So what does that mean? We realize we're both the victim and the persecutor. And that's a very hard realization to swallow, especially if you've been victimized for so long, or especially if you've been persecuting and then you're victimized again because you're being called a persecutor, you're being punished, and you don't want to be victimized and you don't want to persecute and you don't know which way to go all right so the identity so forgiveness is actually the act of forgiveness initiates a process of the total crumbling of identity what does that mean it will feel like death thoughts comments How is it to hear that? Did you expect it? Doesn't this take my, uh, my character, my, uh, my game, my story? Yep. It takes everything away. Once you're, once you're forgiven as the persecutor or once you've forgiven your persecutor as a victim, you can't hold on to that game anymore. You cannot use it as leverage. You cannot say 20 years later, remember when. No, all of it is gone. It's all gone. We've washed our hands. We've said, good job. Thank you. Lessons learned. And we walk away. Not easy to do. Can you, 
what do you feel inside you? Or what, what do you want to say there, Alina? Oh, your, your sound isn't on, Alina. I know you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. I don't, you might have to reconnect your audio there. I think you're, you're here now. Or, or you're, she's going to come back in. Okay. Um, so keep these levels in mind, all right? And what I'm going to show you is the game of opposition and the roles that the victim persecutor play with each other, okay? And then where are the opportunities to begin reconciliation? So let's look at the victim persecutor cycle. Now, we begin the cycle as victim. All that means is that we begin from pure innocence. All right, pure innocence, a blank slate. No defenses, no protection, just a pure, pure soul, all right? What does that mean? We are susceptible. We're susceptible to be victimized. Uh, you're born and just from breathing the, the cold slap of the cold air on you is already victimizing you. Do you understand? You've been persecuted by your environment because you're no, you're no longer in a state of pure essence and unity. All right. The first time, you know, your mother put you down in the crib and walked away. You just got victimized. Okay. Because you were abandoned. Okay. It's every experience, the trauma of every experience victimizes us. And we have these collections of experiences. And then eventually we start to take on the other role of persecutor because we've said, well, I've had enough. I've had enough of feeling powerless. I want the power, okay? And then we become a persecutor. And in order to become a persecutor, another victim is born, all right? So victim and persecutor are always at opposite ends of each other going around this cycle, all right? So that we begin as victim, we'll have our experience as persecutor, and then gradually we let the persecutor go and we return to innocence or to victim. But along the way, we've gained a ton of experience, okay? Is it necessarily we, the same person? This is you, the same person, yes. And the other person will remain the same person? Yes. I mean, okay. Yes. So I'm born as a victim. I'm getting persecuted by other things, other people, other events. And at a certain point, I turn it around and I say, I'm, I'm taking in my power here. But I don't realize, or I do realize, I'm persecuting back to the world, to the events, to another person. Okay. So by me becoming persecutor, I need a victim. Therefore, another victim is created. All right. And then that victim will grow up and then begin persecuting and another victim is born. And this is how it perpetuates, okay? In order to be a victim, there needs to be a persecutor. In order to persecute, there needs to be a victim, okay? Is this clear for everyone? And oh, what happens is like... eventually I, hold on, eventually I let go of my role of persecutor. Now I become a victim again. I'm at risk of being victimized and going another round on the cycle, okay? And then it can be perpetual. So who was trying to come in with something there? Um, come in. Yeah. yeah. Or did we lose you? Yeah, okay, uh, go ahead, Alina. I, I was trying, now, now uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I, I was trying to say last time that, um, in fact, we continue to sit in this cycle until oh, yeah. the story is we feel the story is not more relevant for us and then, our, mm -hmm, go ahead and then actually uh, we don't need the identity we had the change occurred yeah. and we are someone else yeah. out of it yes eventually when we've experienced these roles enough and we become ready to let both of them go, that's when mm -hmm. we start letting the cycle go. And then there are phases we go through for mm -hmm. that letting go process, all right? Now, where regret fits in, because regret, I see the regret fits in both, in the cycle. And did you say regret? 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 Yeah, regret of being persecuted, then yeah. regret of accepting and being a victim. Everywhere. Is the regret everywhere. Is the mo is everywhere. The, is the, 
is it? Yeah. Is it? Is it? Is it the I'm energy going to that drives all of this? I'm going to show you that. This is all based in how here. to the, make peace with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's how do we make peace with that? Because yeah, everything needs to be let go. The past, the history, the regret, the guilt, the shame, the fear, the punishment, the desire for punishment, right? The the self-inflicting wounds. All of it needs to be dissolved. Okay. And it's all but comes in different phases. Like this is like uh, you know choosing uh, a seat uh, where to to sit is like yeah. uh, an empty seat you know you you yeah. just find you just find an empty seat if mm-hmm. i don't find the 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 victim i will uh, sit on the persecutor yeah. that's right seat. yeah mm-hmm. and uh, and i suppose the victim uh, like this is the i don't know in psychologists known that Karpman triangle and right. we have also the savior. It yeah. looks like the victim is the most powerful uh, uh, actor in here because you cannot do anything without the victim. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, uh, there, yes, there's, uh, maybe we can return to that because uh, that is sort, sort of the irony is that the victim always holds the power. The victim had the power all along, right? And that might sound strange. Yeah. It's almost like Dorothy always could go home because she always had the ruby slippers, right? <laughs> Uh, to make a trite, simple example, but because it starts and ends with the victim, that means the victim always has a choice and these are difficult choices, okay? Uh, And victims don't like to hear this, okay? Um, Because it's natural for them not to like it. Uh, Let me just say one thing. Some people may not agree that we're always born innocent, uh, always born into the victim role. Um, How many of you know a baby that came out of the womb with a knife in its hand ready to kill? Yes, but it's true. Right. We always see it like this. So maybe very quickly we move from victim to persecutor and we have a very evil two-year-old child. I don't know, but that child did started from pure innocence in the womb, okay? Um, it's just, it's, it's quite illogical and impossible to be born a persecutor. I just wanna make that very clear, okay? All right? When we come from essence, there is no desire to harm or hurt. We're coming from unity. And when we come from unity, there is nothing to harm or hurt because we are everything. It's an absolute oneness, all right? We're born from essence. So I just want to underline that point. This is why it starts with the victim because we're coming from pure innocence, okay? Um, Also, we're gonna talk about the heart center and the power center. These are two different centers that drive each role. The victim is driven from heart, which means connection, validation, do I exist? The persecutor, is driven from power, control. How do I make sure I exist? I understand now that I exist. How do I make sure I exist, okay? And we'll look at that a little bit more. So what's happening is when they're flipping roles, when the victim flips into the persecutor, they're sacrificing heart for power. When the persecutor flips back to victim, they're sacrificing power for heart. And so part of what the reconciliation cycle is, is how do we reconcile these two centers together without feeling like there's an exchange, okay? There's always this constant battle of how do I maintain authority while still having an open heart and being compassionate and empathetic? How do I maintain an open heart without getting hurt? Do you understand? So on the level of gain, We're in a double bind of, if I use my heart, I'm sacrificing power. If I use my power, I'm sacrificing heart. And that's part of what's driving the victim persecuting rule. It's always a flip and an exchange. Now, before we flip, this is a possible line of forgiveness. This is the window of opportunity to reconcile. And normally it's gonna come from the persecutor because they're about to end the cycle they're quite ready to let it all go and let it drop off and let it dissolve, okay? This is usually why the persecutor is gonna make the first bid for forgiveness. And I'm saying genuine forgiveness. 
there's a difference between genuine, genuine, a genuine bid and the persecutor just manipulating the victim by saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'll show you how to tell the difference when it's genuine and not, okay? Because one way the victim gets victimized again and again is by false bids of forgiveness. And that's what makes it even more difficult for the victim to believe the bid when the true bid for forgiveness actually comes. You've got an echo there, uh, Cesar. I'm just gonna mute one of your lines there, okay? <clears throat> You'll have to mute one or the other because you got a feedback loop going. Uh, is that is that making sense, guys? What I'm saying here is that there can be a bid of forgiveness from the per persecutor. It's up to the victim to accept that bid. This is where they have the choice to liberate both or per perpetuate the cycle. And this is back to who said it. I think it was Yusuf or someone. Maybe the persecutor leaves and leaves the victim hanging. Well, if the victim's gonna remain a victim, they're gonna find another persecutor to take their place. Or they flip, that persecutor's gone off the cycle, they're gonna find another victim. It's just like holding an empty chair. If they're left holding the bag, somebody's gonna fill the role. Uh, somebody wanted to say something here. Um, I think it was me in the beginning who, who uh, asked this question of whether we can just leave the other side with with the reconciliation itself yeah and uh, obviously then this person if it has uh, the weight of yeah. the cycle will have to find another person yeah. and yeah. we can liberate yeah the other person the question now would be do if, if the cycle is incomplete and both people separate and mm -hmm. one person leaves as victim and one person leaves as persecutor, yeah. do yeah. both have an empty chair? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, because they haven't, they both haven't done the reconciliation work. And what, what really is going on is this is an internal reconciliation that needs to happen. Okay. Yeah, we want to clear out, ventilate and reconcile the story between us. But really, I'm, if I'm still carrying this dynamic within me, like for example, parent and child, okay? The child felt victimized by the parent, okay? And then the parent dies. The child still feels like a victim. This is unreconciled, do you understand? And now they, now the parent's dead. So they may get caught in this trap thinking, oh, that'll never be reconciled. I'll, I'll always hold a grudge against my parent for the rest of my own life. And what might happen is I start unwittingly um, as child, when I become parent, I might unwittingly start persecuting my own children out of the frustration that nothing was reconciled. Do you understand? And I will be unconsciously perpetuating the cycle, for example, all right? And that can just go on generationally, whether I like it or not. But if it's unreconciled within me, I'm going to find someone to keep the cycle going. It doesn't have to be the same person, okay? Can't you start another cycle because of that? What I mean is, okay, you have an um, um, you have a relationship that is unsolved because the other person dies, and then mm -hmm. because of guilt, you turn yourself into a victim, and yep. then you're looking for a persecutor, and you start yes. another cycle. That's right. So look, I might not find another persecutor in my life. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to persecute myself. Myself. <laughs> right? So I can complete, so I can keep this, yeah. this, this dynamic going. Okay. Uh -huh. This is the law of polarity. The universe is always trying to balance one side with the other. All right. The pendulum does not swing to one side and stop. The pendulum swings back. So if I'm swinging towards victim role, it's going to want to swing back towards persecutor role. It's going to want to swing back to victim role. And this is what's happening within me. And this is what's happening in the relationship. And the two people could be swapping roles with each other, okay? We're victims of each other. Well, if, I'm, if Alina and I are in a relationship and I feel victimized by her and she victimizes, it feels victimized by me, and we, we're actually swapping roles, but we need to recognize I am both the persecutor and the victim, okay? And that's one step towards reconciliation is recognizing we are both, okay? Now, we may be getting ahead of ourselves here. So um, 
Wow, I think we're going to go longer than an hour, so be prepared. <laughs> so just to reemphasize, we are all born innocent, and we naturally begin as victim. That's just because we're victimized by life. We get the hard knocks of life, okay? Um, so it's important to remember that the full cycle begins and ends with victim. And victim and persecutor are always at opposite ends of the, the cycle. The wheel just keeps turning, okay? Um, when victim crosses the line into persecutor, they create another victim. And that's very hard for victims to learn, admit, or realize, okay? Because sometimes they start putting their toe over the line. They start persecuting, but they're in denial of it, all right? And they say, ah, but I've, I've been a victim my whole life. You know, I, I need to stand up for myself. But they end up persecuting, and they don't even realize it, okay? So it's not that like they cross the line. They're going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is a very, very challenging place to be. And to stop the cycle, the victim needs to stop here. They need to drop the cycle before they become persecutor, okay? And that feels very unnatural because they've only gone through half their cycle. The persecutor has gone through the full cycle. It feels extremely unfair. And it is up to the victim to decide if they abandon their cycle. Now, this might sound like martyrdom, but it is not heroism, okay? And I'll explain that in a bit. So when the persecutor bids forgiveness from the victim and the victim has a choice to accept the forgiveness or not, they're choosing, if they accept the forgiveness, to not cross the line, okay? And there's a lot of risk involved in that because they're, they're going to miss out on a whole half cycle of life experience. And a lot of it is about they want to balance the scales. So when we go back to the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, the victim is choosing not to retaliate. So the persecutor took an eye, so the victim is missing an eye. The persecutor has both eyes. And the victim says, that's fine, that's okay. You have your two and I have my one, we're done. Just take that in for a second. How easy is it to do that? What happens for you when you think of that or take that on or take it in? You took my eye, you can have your two, let's drop it and walk away. That's ultimately feel, what, what's being asked of the victim the, I feel when they the choose guilt. not to cross the line. Yeah, you feel, Cesar, okay, go ahead. Yeah. I, I feel the guilt, you know, it's like immediately I, I start thinking about guilt. Guilt I, on whose part? Guilt on my part because I, I cannot conceive being... Yeah, but, but who are you speaking from, victim or persecutor, when you say guilt on your part? You know, it's like uh, like a pendulum. It's like I'm flipping the the, the rolls. Okay. Uh, and guilt, the guilt, guilt comes parts? from the from the movement uh, from one role to another. Okay. When when I stay in into the role, I don't feel any guilt. You know, but when I when I switch roles, I feel guilt. I don't know. Why. Okay. 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 Anyone so, else? Yeah, two things popped in my head. Uh, mm -hmm. First of, first one is like being okay with being violated, but yet if I retaliate to be the prosecute, prosecute mm -hmm. yeah, I will uh, maybe I will lose more than an eye then because it's gonna keep vicious yes. cycle. But yes. uh, what what the previous uh, uh, person spoke is like uh, I get from it. It's like you're stopping the pendulum now. So stopping mm -hmm. the pendulum is that this door is the void. Again, back to my same story, it's like killing the identity, or you know what I mean? Yes. So one of them is safety, being mm -hmm. violated, but it's safety, it's navigating from head and everything. The second yeah. one is like void, emptiness, خلاص, okay. done. Yani, in a way, you, you, let's say relationship between boyfriend and girlfriend, uh, it's yeah. like break up on a good note. Okay, I accept what you did, blah, 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 but this is it, you have your life, I have my life. Right. So this is like, 
you've been stolen from, from a thief over and over again. And then the, st the thief says, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I didn't mean it. I won't do it again. Please forgive me. And you say, okay, I forgive you. And then the thief says, may I come into your house? That's the test of the forgiveness, right? Um, what is it? Like, so you let them in your house. Now they could steal again. For you to ultimately forgive, it's I forgive you. I forgive you for being the thief. I even dissolve the role that you are a thief and I'm risking that you can steal from me again. So, and then I might think, God, I was so stupid to forgive you because there you go. You betrayed me one more time, right? So true forgiveness means the victim lets all of that go. They're even taking the risk that they could be victimized again by the same persecutor and they're still letting it go. Okay, they're going to feel like an absolute doormat. Okay, that's the risk of dropping, right, of dropping the cycle, because it's a lot easier to say, you know what, I forgive you, but I'm going to keep my eye on you. <laughs> right? That's yeah. already moving across the line into persecutor. All right. Because now I'm going to hold you prisoner and I have power over you. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to let this go. That's a gain of power. Okay. So let me put it to you this way. When we are presented with the choice to forgive, that can feel like the ultimate victimization to the victim because they're being asked to drop everything and sacrifice everything, okay? They're, they could just dissolve back into nothing, okay? Um, that sacrifice can feel unbearable but at the same time, for the victim, it's also unbearable to continue the cycle and become exactly like the persecutor. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do I drop it and maybe have total victimization or do I continue and become exactly like the persecutor that I hate? Do you guys get this? It's a yep. very yeah. difficult choice. When you said it the first when you said it the first time, I thought from a victim point of view, it feels like letting go with only one eye feels so totally unfair. Yep. But it at is. the same time, that's where you get freedom because you're not in the game anymore. And exactly. that's where, yeah, that's where your power. Yeah. Or, and we're so pulled to want to gouge out that other eye because we're so pulled to balance our opposites. Do you understand? Two eyes and one eye don't feel balanced, right? And we have to shake that. That's why I say it demands resilience. It demands humility. It demands acceptance, okay? So I think I might have beaten this point to a, as a dead horse here or whatever, okay? <laughs> beaten this to a pulp. I see, okay. I see too. I see two other um, um, possible scenarios in, in your example. So, uh, in your thief example. Um, mm -hmm. So, I'd like to know how they would be different from, from what you're saying. So, one scenario, scenario is telling the person, okay, so uh, I forgive you. Um, and know that if it ever happens again, so I, I believe that it's absolutely possible that you don't do it anymore. And I welcome that. But at the same time, know that if it happens again, I will call the police. So that's one alternative scenario. And the other one is, okay, uh, I don't want to take the risk that you come into my house. So you're not welcome into my house anymore. But I do appreciate your other qualities. So I'm okay to go for a drink with you, have fun, uh, play basketball, whatever. But you're not welcome into my house anymore. We'll be friends, but you don't come into my house. So how is this... Because then I, I'm, I'm protecting my, myself. So how, how are these two scenarios not um, uh, forgiveness? Uh, in, uh, in, in um, I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. They're both uh, false forgiveness, okay? But they are steps toward a reconciliation, all right? But they are still false forgiveness. It won't dissolve the cycle. Why? Because you've just laid down conditions. Mm -hmm. The forgiveness is unconditional, mm. okay? okay? Now, this brings up the question, well, how do we forgive while still holding people accountable, okay? And that, because we've got to work out the accountability. 
but there's a fine balance between holding each other accountable and exacting revenge. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, but it, it, to make it really simple, it does boil down to there is sacrifice made. And we're, when we're okay with the sacrifice, we're mm -hmm. able to proceed through that death's door of dropping the cycle. Because you see, Philippe, you're saying, oh, I'll forgive you, but only so far. And then here are the conditions. You're not allowed in my house. Next time I'll call the police. Da, 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 da. That's not true forgiveness. That is accepting perhaps an apology and saying, okay, you know, let bygones be bygones. But what you're basically saying is I still don't trust you. Mm -hmm. You're not, I'm not fully in unity with you. And I just, and I don't quite love you. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let me use an, another example then. Well, you can um, give me thousands, Philippe. Yeah, yeah. But th this one, this one, I, um, I think is quite interesting. So, um, let's say I met a girl and things go go nicely, and then I think that we and and she says uh, that we're, we're a couple, etc. And then I discover she's unfaithful, but uh, we really have good chemistry. And then I behave quite maturely and think, okay. So maybe it would be a bit extreme that I push her completely away. I tell her I never want to see her again. So I just look at it objectively and say, okay, so what works? The chemistry works. What doesn't work? Uh, being in an exclusive relationship. Uh, so she's faithful because she can't, for good or bad reasons, she can't be faithful to me. And then I tell her, okay, so how about we stay, uh, we continue to meet and we continue to have sex uh, and have good time, a good time together. But uh, we're not in a couple, so we're not exclusive. Then, uh, I mean, what we, to me, there is forgiveness, there's acceptance uh, that she is how she, how she is and not the way I expected or imagined. I'm going to interrupt you, Philippe. Yeah? That's not forgiveness. It's what you're doing is you're repackaging the game and re redressing yeah. the rules. And so you're accepting a new game with new rules, new conditions, okay? Mm -hmm but you're not reconciling that old game. You're, you're saying, okay, we're not gonna play that game anymore. Let's create a new one that's okay. more acceptable for both of us. That's the difference of what you're describing, okay? But then so let's I, not, conf and, and maybe you, you drop that game and you don't play it again, but if there's still resentment sitting like, oh, I wish we you know, could, could, could have the old game and it could be better. We're not actually dropping it. But what you're describing mm -hmm. is just a repackaging of the roles and a repackaging of the game mm -hmm. in yeah. order to get into, find the way to remain in an essential relationship with a packaging mm -hmm. that works. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. But my, Troy, actual, question, but my actual question was, would be, um, okay, wouldn't I be a fool if I stayed in the same relationship? Yes, that's the, the sacrifice is that, yeah, you probably so, are a fool to unconditionally forgive and how does that feel and notice yes. the guilt and the shame that comes upon yourself and then still to let that go too mm -hmm. okay okay what i want to say i'm interrupting you philip for a reason mm -hmm. here because we can go all day long with this okay um you can't get out of this you can't this is a death's door meaning there's really just one choice mm -hmm. there's one yes, choice to drop one choice to to cross the line mm -hmm. and in order to cross the line in order to drop the game, you also drop the persecutor and you have no more tracking or control about who they are or what they do. You do not expect them to change. Yes. That's, that's how it is. Ooh, what yes. just made you smile there, Chris? You just, you just lit right up. And I'm, and I'm holding you back there, Philippe. I'm not letting you come in. <laughs> hold on, you'll come in back in eventually. Yeah, uh, hold on, I want to hear from Chris for a second. Yeah, go ahead, Chris, and then I'll get to you, Cesar. You do not expect them to change. I love that's it. Right. Mm -hmm. You do not. Ex that's the hardest thing to do. Okay. You forgive them and they walk away and they can still be the nasty persecutor that they are. Okay. That's yeah. extremely hard to do. Okay. Because but, um, otherwise, if you're monitoring them, you're trying to control them. And guess what? You've become a persecutor because you're now driven by control. Cesar. Yeah, uh, um, I want uh, your uh, opinion on this. I yep. see two main themes here. 
one theme is uh, shifting uh, total shift in awareness uh, mm-hmm. self awareness and the second shift it's uh, it's a quantum leap in terms of logic and system Absolutely. of thinking and system of yeah. because it strikes you you know uh, mm-hmm. it's one system of thinking and and reasoning when you're a persecutor when you're a victim and when you're a savior it, it, yeah. it needs to be a total different shift in terms of logic because you cannot yes. uh, forgive with the same logic that you persecuted right yeah it, it is a quantum leap in logic and um like look how how hard you guys are fighting look, look philip how you're coming in with yet another thing and another thing just notice that energy that this is not an easy thing to do okay we we, we spend more time resisting it and i'm not saying do not mistake what i'm saying here i am not obligating anyone to forgive i want to make that very very clear because that's a manipulation in itself when we start obligating ourselves to forgive okay so just, now I'll let you in there Philippe. In yeah. that situation you wouldn't you would, wouldn't advise uh, I mean you wouldn't be advising the person to stay in that relationship and just uh, as as a couple and just uh, say uh, this person should just wait for for the other person to just fuck uh, every, everybody and well, just accept that and Philippe, think it's, it's okay where are you story game dream source right now as that's, you're talking that, uh, that's um um that story yeah. yeah and i'm not going to engage with it right now mm-hmm. because we got a million stories let's look at getting into the, the dream portion here okay we need to understand the game to get to the dream mm-hmm. when you start understanding this more you'll have your own answers on what to do about that story okay it, it's, but if it's, i answer your question on the level of story we're going to bump up at, at this game and we're never going to cross down that red line Okay. Yeah. It's, it's fictional. Uh, it's just, yeah. um, yeah. because the story needs to reinforce itself and it's going to find a thousand reasons why I can't really truly unconditionally forgive. I need mm-hmm. conditions to preserve my story. But I felt that in, in my proposition, my proposition of, of, uh, changing the relationship there was before the changing, there was an acceptance of, uh, okay, so the person is like that. That's what they're Sure, looking. but now notice, Philippe, and I'm, I'm interrupting you on purpose to illustrate a point. You're still not comfortable with it. You're still asking yourself, am I okay with the choice I made? That means it's not done. No, it's, I am okay. No, you're not, because you wouldn't be bringing this up. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant uh, example of how do we meet our clients yeah. into into which stage would do we meet our clients? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Philippe, look, suspend yeah. it for a moment, okay? And if you feel this uh, this unfinished business, get to know that feeling, okay? Because that will move you faster towards reconciliation. As soon as you can be okay with this, it's unfinished. But Did I'm- I do the right thing? I don't okay. know. And no, drop it. Right? Get used to that. That will yeah. build your resilience and humility to move closer towards the act of forgiveness and reconciliation. So let's not, I'm not going to engage with it anymore. I'm going to suspend it. I'm going to leave you hanging. After the webinar, we can come back into the discussion. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you have time for it. Okay. Now we need to understand polarity and these four basic, um, uh, behaviors of I flee and my emptiness, my sense of annihilation. I fight the emptiness. This is like no identity. Okay. I'll flee that and I'll fight it because I want to cling to my identity, my sense of fulfillment, my sense of fullness, and I'm seeking to feel full. I'm seeking to be right. Okay. This is how story works. All right. This is how games work. All right. We, our identity wants to fill itself up with knowledge and power and validation. It's always looking to gain power so it feels safe. As soon as it starts losing power or losing validation, it's going into danger and it feels like it may not exist anymore. These are the basics of polarity. So when we naturally are oriented towards safety, recognition, and power, all right? then life will start to push us in the other direction and we will feel threatened. I'm losing my identity. I'm losing power. I'm losing recognition. I'm losing connection. And we will flee that and fight it. Okay. So this is important to keep in mind that both the victim and the persecutor 
are at different poles of the polarity. And I'll show you that here, okay? And there's a double bind where they're, they're actually cross-hatched, cross okay? So now, the victim has a double personality. So it is the persecutor because within the victim is a secret persecutor. Within the persecutor is a secret victim. Remember, this is easier to understand. The persecutor came from victim, okay? Um, so on one side, the victim says, I don't like to be a victim and I wanna flee. I wanna flee this role. But what they're also realizing is they're fleeing their heart and seeking power. On the other hand, the victim wants to cling to their heart. That means they're clinging to the role of victim and that can create an identity, okay? And as they, uh, as it gets stronger to want to seek power, to want to balance the scales, they're going to fight becoming that persecutor. They're going to fight power. They might sneak around and use the power a bit, but then fight it off because they're clinging to this heart. Just think how the victim has this internal dynamic of fleeing the role, clinging to the heart, fighting the role, but seeking the power. Fighting the role of persecutor and seeking the power. What just made you laugh there, Chris? Oh, you're muted, so. Yes, yeah, same thing. Um, just seeing it playing out like that. Okay. So you, the, the, the victim already has an internal conflict. Now also think as time goes by, they're gradually being led around this cycle through life circumstances and experience. And then it's gonna come a time where they're hitting this line, all right? And this is a really volatile place to be because on one hand, they are seeking the power Oh my God, because guess what's happening? The persecutor they're seeing is getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And the persecutor is about to become a baby, totally losing power. There's a big temptation to use that power against the persecutor and give them a taste of their own medicine. But then they say, oh my God, but then I'll become exactly like them. They fight it off. They might toe the line and get a taste of that power, but then flee and come back here. Or they might cling to it and start getting a little addicted to it and say, wow, that feels good, rush of power, okay? And what this can look like is the victim suddenly sees the persecutor get down on their knees and bow their head and say, I'm wrong for what I've done. Well, the victim is gonna raise themselves up and say, aha, you finally admit it, finally, okay? And they're gaining status, they're gaining a rush of power. But what they're asking for is you not only have to pay, but I want you to recognize that I have the power right now. You need to recognize that. And that's what's not going to, they're not going to let that persecutor go until the persecutor recognizes and says, okay, you have all the power. And even then it might not be enough. And it's humiliating for the persecutor to admit this because what they're doing is when they're saying, you have all the power, you've always had the power, I have no power, they're giving up something here and they're crossing their line back into victim. But there's a catch here. And I'll explain this in a moment. The one thing, this is gonna sound strange, the, the victim does not realize that they've always possessed internal power. And this is what upset the persecutor all along, all right? The persecutor has a total lack of internal power. They are constantly on pursuit of proving that they have power. They're seeking power from outside of themselves. And it's the victim that is truly reconciled with their own internal power the point is they choose not to use it because they have an opinion or a bias about power. They think it's cruel and heartless. The irony is that the victim does not have a sense of internal recognition or validation. They're constantly seeking it from the outside. So when the victim is saying, I want you to recognize that I have the power, they're still playing victim. 
because they are not recognizing themselves. They are not able to validate themselves and recognize that they actually have power. They're waiting for someone else to recognize it for them. And that's the trap. Is this making sense what I'm saying? Does it sound really weird? Okay. And then the persecutor is the other way around. Why is the victim so upset by the persecutor? Because the persecutor totally possesses a solid form of internal validation. This is what enables them to be so cruel and heartless because they don't, no matter how they exercise power, they know who they are. They're done with, like, I know I exist, okay? The point is, I don't know if I can control my existence. So I'll do anything it takes to control my existence. I'm going to exercise power because I'm not sure if I have it. So the victim looks at the persecutor and says, oh my God, you're so heartless and cruel. How could you do that to me or to anyone else? Well, because I'm okay with it. I'm okay with myself, therefore I'm okay with it. And that irks the victim because they're like, don't you have compassion? Well, actually the, the persecutor does have a heart. They just choose not to use it because they feel that flip. If I use my heart, I've now lost my power. This is why a persecutor will never be vulnerable because they perceive it as being weak. But Troy, yeah. some, sometimes prosecutor come to the line before the victim and he's stuck there and he make peace. Yep, it could happen. And we'll yeah. get to that in a Same. second. And, and oh, you're going the, there, okay. And sometimes the persecutor can trick the victim by appealing to the, the victim's heart, their weakness. They seek validation, so the persecutor gives them all the validation. Oh my God, I realize I hurt you. I'm so sorry. And all I do is I love you. And, and look, I'm opening my heart to you. They're not truly opening their heart. They're giving a show of it to get power from the victim so that the victim can melt and then the persecutor can pounce. Okay. And that's a betrayal. For a, vic, for a persecutor to have true vulnerability, it's to truly relinquish all power and lay themselves completely vulnerable to be overpowered. They're willing to be now victimized and not retaliate, okay? Yeah, but I mean, they're not willing to be victimized, but they're willing to stop at the heart. No, the persecutor in order to cross their line is perfectly willing to return to victim. Mm. So the, the ultimate reconciliation that we do is we're reconciling our heart and our power centers together within ourselves so that when we exercise authority, we're not losing connection, compassion, empathy, and we're not afraid to be demanding of others. We're not afraid to create accountability. And, we're, and when we are connecting with each other, when we are loving unconditionally, we're not losing any sense of authority or autonomy. This is very difficult to reconcile within ourselves, all right? We could do fake reconciliations, but um, still what, what we're trying to do is, is create a unity of heart and power, a true unconditional unity, that they're both the same. Now, here's some ways we can fake it a false gain of validation. I can impose guilt on you and shame on you, or you can impose guilt on me and shame on me okay, in order to gain power through validation. Or, you know what, I could, I could um, say to the persecutor, I forgive you, but then I'll be thinking, look how important I am. Or I can be the persecutor and I can flatter you in order to have power for, over you. So when I'm gaining a, doing a false gain of validation, I'm working with guilt, shame, importance, and flattery, whether that I'm drawing on your weakness or your strength, or I'm drawing on my weakness or my strength. But this is a false gain of validation. We can also do false gains of power. I can uh, make you fearful and think I'm becoming powerful. I can make you feel obligated and blackmail you and make you feel make me feel powerful i can um make you feel like a hero okay that's a bit more of playing into your sense of validation or i can feel like a hero and think i'm powerful and elitism is more like collusion okay 
I'm going to give you the secret sauce. Only just keep this between you and me. All right. Um, or we, I am superior. We are superior. That's a sense of false inner power of we are the elite. All right. And they are the stupid ones. They are the lower ones. Okay. That's a false sense of power as well. Heroism, elitism, fear, and obligation. We use these tactics to trick each other, manipulate each other. What are your responses here? I'm not sure if you're understanding clearly, but we can do false bids of forgiveness using any eight of these. You should forgive me. I'll make you feel guilty or shameful. If you forgive me, then you'll become an important person, right? If you forgive me, people will revere you and make you a hero. If I make a bid for forgiveness and get on my knees and lower my head and say, I'm sorry for everything I've done, I'll look good. Those are false bids. Do you guys understand? Because we're using the bid of forgiveness to either gain more validation or gain more power, whether that's we ask for the forgiveness or give the forgiveness, okay? This is like what you were doing, Philippe. Look, I'll, I'll forgive you for this, that, and the other. Now I can feel good about me. You can feel good about you. Now I feel important. But don't you ever dare try to try that again on me, right? Now I'm exercising power over you. I've, I've just created conditions. So it was a false bid of forgiveness. Do you guys understanding here? Not, not from my experience, but okay. You need to reflect on that, okay? Because it was really clear you were using some of these eight when you told the story. No, I don't, I don't agree. I disagree. Go do a replay when you get the recording, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, by I mean, the way, Philippe. No exchange, but I mean, from mm -hmm. what I, I went through, I know that uh, that's not what happened. I know that it was just, uh, I was just looking for what, what worked without any friction. So, and that was, that was okay. So you were a martyr? No, no. I was just looking for something that worked. I, I wasn't looking for to be to be a martyr or to. Okay, and looking for something that worked. And if if you found something that worked, what would make what would that make you a good person or a bad person? It was not really about me. It was about um, uh, it was about um, a harmony between me and the other person. Okay, but you're the one that needs to create it or, or come up with the idea for it. I didn't feel really any need. It was just that um, what we had didn't work. So I was thinking, okay, so what could work? And then I proposed. And yeah, yeah, of course. Right. Also so what you're doing is you're opening a new chapter in the game. I'm not yeah. saying that's necessarily, that's not about necessarily a bit of forgiveness. But to really let it go, we're talking about letting go of the entire cycle. That means to be okay with the disharmony. Otherwise, you're still trying to control the relationship because you're trying to control how it ends and it needs to end harmoniously. For, no matter how noble it sounds, okay? That's what I'm saying. That's that bid that hooks us in, all right? Forgiveness does not have to feel all completely clean, okay? I want to ask something that might be controversial. Like yep. uh, when you say we have to let go of the entire cycle and then it's gone, that's if you want um, can, to dissolve it, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the thing. Like, if we if we cling to the cycle or we want to continue the cycle, then there are more lessons to learn. Right. So yeah, it, it, we would it, also it, lose opportunities for learning when yes. we end the victim persecutor cycle. Yes, this is why it's not advisable to rush pattern. into it. Uh, we we'll keep repeating the same pattern. Nothing, uh, no more learning there. Well, and if the pattern keeps repeating, there's, there's no more learning. No, there is still something to learn. You just haven't seen it. It's like digging deeper. Yeah, got to dig deeper. And we'll, but not we'll necessarily. Gonna... We can also just let it go. Oh, well, if you do the work to let it go. You can't just let it go and walk away. Right. Say, yeah, done, right? Uh, so we have to go through all chapters and make all learning possible before we can let go. Ah, all right. This is where everyone is responsible to themselves. What, the, the day we stop pointing fingers and saying it's your fault, you caused this. It's true it might be their fault and they caused it, but it is not their fault that you're, that it's, that you're perpetuating it. Do you understand? That's where it flips. You abused me. 
Okay, we acknowledge that. But now for me to walk through life feeling continually abused, even when you're not there, I'm the one perpetuating it. Do you understand? Not you anymore. So now I'm actually persecuting you by holding it over your head. Okay? Even if it was 20 years of abuse. So if I think it takes 20 years for you to be in the doghouse so I can feel like it's justified now, then that's what it's going to be. But I cannot call myself a victim at that point. I am a persecutor. It's a very strong statement. Okay? But people need to realize that. And, and you just can't just wash your hands and walk away and say, oh, I'm done. Right? You have to do the work on yourself. And we're going to show you that here. I know we're going over the hour. But if it's interesting, stay on the line. <laughs> I'm already noting questions that I'm not asking, you know. <laughs> and you can. And, and you know what? I, you know, I'm going to finish the webinar and then I will hang around for more Q&A, okay? I, like I said at the beginning, this is not an easy thing to swallow, okay? And it's really, really, really weird, okay? Because it's, it's, it's unnatural for us to do this, hence the title. Now, let's look at how victims and persecutors perceive each other. According to the persecutor, victims are perceived as powerless, all right? But the po it's not that they are powerless. They refuse to use power because they lack a sense of internal validation. Okay, it's like I'm not worthy to use the power or I don't know how. I don't know what, if, as soon as you give a victim power, they don't know what to do with it. And partly how you can tell they don't know what to do with it is they go nuts with it. They don't use it adeptly, okay? So practically they are sincere when they feel powerless. They are sincere when they okay. feel power. They feel they powerless. Feel, yes, when they feel they powerless. Don't, what they don't know is they possess power. Uh, and exactly. I'll tell you why in a second. Okay? Yeah, okay. So they have a perception of power that they disown within themselves. They see power and control as cruel and heartless. And therefore they choose to forfeit it. They sacrifice it. They give it up. They're making that exchange. I choose my heart over power because I value connection and validation over power, okay? Persecutors are the opposite. They are perceived as heartless beings, all right, by the victim. It's not that they are heartless. They refuse to use the heart, and it's because they lack internal power. This is, sounds really weird, okay? Um, they, they, they see uh, the, the heart and love and connection as a weakness where they would, if they used it, they would completely lose all power, okay? Now, what they don't realize is in order for them to use power, they're actually okay with themselves. They're okay with themselves to use power. They're okay with themselves to be cruel. That means they're actu they actually possess an internal validation, all right? They're just constantly obsessed with trying to prove that they have power, all right? So they see love and connection as weak and vulnerable. Therefore, they choose to forfeit it because they're obsessed with gaining power and they do not want to lose it. So the irony is that victims already contain the internal power a persecutor desires. Why? Because they can withstand oppression and survive. It's, the, it's a simple fact. They can withstand the abuse. They can get the, be whipped over and over and over again, and they're still alive, and they're still there, and they're still using their heart. Do you guys understand this? Okay. So they don't realize. They think they're constantly losing their power. They don't realize that they're incredibly resilient to res withstand the abuse. Okay but they feel it is unfair, okay? And they're so, uh, because they've had such bad examples of power and hurt and suffering, they associate power is no good. It's not good to use. Do you, do you guys get what I'm saying here? They become afraid of it and they disown it. And then they forget that they actually own it internally. And that's what drives the persecutor crazy because the persecutor says, Oh my God, I can abuse you. 
and I can victimize you and you're still here and you're still alive and you're still withstanding it. I could never go through that myself. I would never, ever, ever allow myself to withstand that. And that's the tell that they lack internal power. They would rather persecute than be persecuted. Do you guys understand this? Okay. What's your definition of internal power? Is it just what you said about withstanding um, abuse or is there more to it? It's that the power is within me. I possess power already. I don't seek it because I have it. But, but what, what do you mean by internal by power? You define that, Philippe. Because I'm not gonna play this validation game with you. <laughs> Practically every persecutor has their own definition of what their power, power is. It's a show of power, it's a yeah. use of power, yeah. and it's yeah. a search for power. And they'll never have enough power to feel uh -huh. safe, okay? Someone who already has power is already feeling internally secure. That's why a, a victim can stay in place and take it, and take it, and take it. Do you understand? Doesn't mean they like it, but they can take it. There's that level of resilience, okay? So they're not concerned with losing power because they feel they've lost all of it. And the irony is that means they have power, okay? When they look at the persecutor and they say, how can you be so cruel? Well, it's because the persecutor is totally okay with themselves. They have already an internal sense of I exist, I'm valid. I don't need any recognition or validation from any of you. What I need is to know that I have power. Now you could say, yeah, but what about those megalomaniacs that those dictators that exercise the power and then create themselves as heroes and they, and they enjoy the applause. Okay. Well, there's the validation that they have power. It is not that they have your love. They don't want your love. They don't care about your love and admiration. They want you to recognize the power. Do, do you guys understand the difference? Okay. They want to know that they have power over you. See, when you go and you applaud the, the dictator, they just say, huh, I have power over you. Good to know. <laughs> it's not about that you love them. They don't need your love. They just need to know you're in the weak position. Does this make sense? Because they, they can validate themselves no problem. That's how they could be a narcissist too, okay? A victim can also be a narcissist, but it's because they're constantly asking, am I okay? Am, am I real? Am I real? Am I real? And that can become self-obsessed. Okay. How are you guys doing with this information? Okay. All right. So this feels so counterintuitive. Like, what do you mean the victim contains power already? What do you mean the, the persecutor actually contains validation already? They, they're both holding a prize over each other. The victim doesn't know it, but they have all the power that the persecutor desires. The persecutor doesn't know it, but it has all the heart that the victim desires, meaning all the validation that the victim desires, okay? That's what's holding them together, okay? So we are constantly toggling between a victim and persecutor in our daily pursuit for love and control. We want to belong and we want to exist and we want to control our existence. We want to feel safe and secure. So actually internally, we're embodying both roles. It's just one role at a time and we're flip-flopping. So knowing that, that we play both roles, instead of me focusing on the person who betrayed me, you know, to say they're sorry and, 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 and I need the forgiveness. I can actually work within myself between my own heart and power centers. Okay. And then two things can happen. I won't get so affected by that betrayal and I won't walk into the traps of betrayal so easily. Okay. Because it takes two for the betrayal to happen. So when we play both roles and we can reconcile our own internal cycle of victim persecutor, um, we can begin to accept that we are both roles, okay? 
And it's very difficult for a victim to say, I'm also a persecutor. It's very difficult for a persecutor to say, I'm also a victim, okay? Um, so the, this is what's going on internally with a victim. They've cut out their power, power center and they're, 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 they're navigating their life from fear driven by the heart. And they're just constantly obsessed with seeking connection, validation, love, and they want to belong and they want to exist. Okay. This is also can help explain why would a victim start falling in love with their persecutor when they're beaten down so much? Like that's really weird. Like codependent abusive relationships. Why does the victim always run back? Okay. Okay. Cause they haven't flipped. So they're still seeking the validation. They may want to be emancipated and they want to be free, but then something pulls them back in because they haven't embraced their own internal power and they're going to choose the validation, even if it's painful. All right. Sounds a little, very simplistic, but if they're, if, if they're denouncing this, they're going to keep seeking this to keep reinforcing it. All right. So, the victim finds safety coming from the heart. They cling to it and they're constantly seeking to validate themselves. They're fighting power and fleeing from it. So they will never, ever accept it within themselves. All right. Because they do not want to be known as cruel and heartless. So they're choosing validation over power and they're using external validation to validate themselves. They are never validating themselves from within. They're always checking Am I right? Am I good? Am I okay? Am I still a victim? Okay. It's the invalidation that's empowering them. And they are never executing power because that equals heartlessness. All right. This is all driven from no internal sense of validation. Once they begin to validate themselves without needing anyone else to do it with them, that's when they start opening their power. Okay. Any comments on that? I see you nodding, Chris, just to... I'm having a small yeah. Yeah, go ahead, they, they, they might never execute power, but they can hold a grudge, right? Like they can be like angry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so why might... would they be holding a grudge? What are they clinging to when they're holding a grudge? Uh, they're well, they know that they would like to be powerful, or they know that they have been abused, and they, they know that they're like in a dilemma. When I'm holding a grudge to you, Paul, you betrayed me, you took power away from me. All right, I need you to recognize that I have power too, that I'm equal to you. Yeah, okay. Well, where am I coming from? Power or validation? I can stand up to you, and I can argue, and I can fight you in court and I can get all the laws changed so that you recognize me uh -huh. as equal. Where am I coming from? Validation or power? Validation. Exactly. Uh, actually, I want your validation, but I can't right. really get it, so I'm using all the power. I'm going to use I, I, I power, can't, I can't even but I'm ask still for driven it. by it's the nice. validation, okay? So, uh, like, with minorities, and they say, we want equal rights, equal justice, all of this. Okay, so great. Let's get all the laws changed, but it still is... You slip up once and they're like, hey, wait, you, you didn't recognize that, that I have equal power to you. The point is they have to come within themselves and say, I don't need you to recognize that I have equal power to you. I just am equal. Even if you don't treat me as equal, I am. And we're done. But that's very hard to do and very hard to say because they don't trust it's going to happen. That's the thing. Okay. Yeah. That so means they still haven't used their internal power. Okay. And that's why they hate white privilege so much because the white privilege just says, I have no problem with validation. I am who I am. That, that just burns them alive. Do you understand? And so what they can resort to is, well, then you should feel guilty. You should feel shameful for all of your privilege. You should give it up. Okay. And then, the white privilege can get down on one knee and bow their head. And then they could say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But internally, if, if they're not truly recognizing the victim as a victim, they're just giving the minority lip service and saying, I'll play this game until the victim shuts up. 
because they're unwilling to actually give away the power to the victim and recognize that the victim actually had the power all along. But it's easy for me to bend on one knee, bow my head and, and, and kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds with a mask on my face. That's easy to do. But I'm, I'm not going to be the one under that foot. Do you notice? All this reverence of let's get down on one knee for eight minutes, 40 seconds. Nobody got under the foot. Do you understand? So to me, that's a false show. That's a false bit of forgiveness, okay? And I'm just gonna leave it at that. <laughs> and then we can come back to it. Um, what are the dominant symptoms of the persecutor? They're not using the heart. They're, because that is considered weakness, all right? So they're driven, their fear center, which is the brain for safety and danger. They're navigating all fear and danger through a power, a source of power, movement, control, bullying, aggressiveness, protection. They're, they're using that, that um, power center, control. So they're fighting against the heart, fleeing the heart. That, for them, represents vulnerability and weakness. They're clinging to power and constantly searching for power, okay? Why? Because they lack a total sense of internal power. They're trying to fill themselves up with it. They're choosing power over validation and they use external power to empower themselves. They, I use power, I exert power over you to feel powerful inside, okay? That's how they validate themselves, through power. Okay, they never seek outside validation. I don't need your approval to do anything. This is what makes it very easy for a CEO to fire somebody because I don't care what anybody thinks for the sake of the business, I'm firing you. I'm sorry, it's business, it's not personal. They don't have a problem with that because they're not obsessed with validation. Do you guys understand? And that's how they can make decisions that feel unfair or cruel because they're not seeking outside validation. It's already reconciled within them. I know I'm a good business person and therefore I'm making a good business decision. And for the sake of my business, in order to maintain security and certainty and make profits and, and you know, hold the power position of my company, I have no problem cutting you out. Do you, do you understand? It's for the sake of power. Um, if they seek approval that's considered weakness. Is it okay if I fire you? Do you feel bad? Suddenly I'm in a weak position and now I'm gonna lose power, I'm gonna lose leverage in the negotiation and I might get taken advantage of. Oh, I'm so sorry you feel bad and that it doesn't feel fair. Well, how can I work that out with you? Because I want it to feel equal and fair. Well, now you're gonna take advantage of me. I'm taking that risk. I will never take that risk when I'm being driven by power. Did you guys understand that? That's a logic to it, okay? This is why I'm not gonna ask, does this feel fair? I'm gonna tell you exactly what I think you need to hear and do so you will shut up so I can keep the power. That's why I'm gonna get down on one knee and bow my head. And hopefully you're just gonna go away. Do you guys understand this? False bit of, so they have no internal sense of power. That's why there's a constant show of power. And the death store for them is to use the heart because when, we're there, when they use the heart, they feel it's a total loss of power, okay? So forgiveness equals acceptance plus resilience. Like how do we reconcile these together without feeling a loss, okay? I'll just pause there for a second. I know we're now at the hour and a half point. Um, If I go on, it's going to be another half an hour. So <clears throat> would you like to stay on? As I can show you the process and stages of forgiveness. Now I've given you the background to it, okay? I'm going to just briefly stop the recording so that this divides into a part one and part two, all right? If I stop the recording and then restart, it just saves me putting it in the editor, all right? So just on this much, what are you taking away? And then I'll uh, just want to hear briefly, just what's happening for you? What are you taking away from this so far? And then we'll restart with um, the actual forgiveness cycle, forgiveness loop. Anyone?
what I see, yes. I see both are fair. Uh, both uh, you need to you need to use both of them, especially when you brought up the CEO uh, example. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter how uh, uh, to, internally again how to deal with it. You have to be uh, right. saturated or, or uh, very strong at one point to mm -hmm. go there, but at one point have the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the access, for I mean, before the prosecutor reached the heart, and but you mentioned also something when when the victim reached the prosecute stage and he can play little at the early Go stages there. Yeah. yeah, if he stops there, he gets the taste of it, satisfaction of it, and he can be balanced again. That's right. And by the way, while the victim toes the line, toggles back and forth, right? There's such a cognitive dissonance going on. Okay. Like, who am I? What am I? Like, it's like flips of personality, okay? And then a lot of self-persecution and self-punishment. But the same thing is happening with the persecutor at the other end of the line. They're dipping the toe from persecutor victim back and forth. And again, lots of self-persecution and self-victimization and self-punishment. Uh, Both are experiencing this. And guess what? That's what's happening right now in the world. We have such an opportunity for reconciliation. And this is why... We're seeing such crazy behavior right now because both victim and persecutor are towing the line. They're going nuts. They're going nuts. Yeah. So, and each side feels fully rightly justified in what they are and what they're doing. Okay. And they're creating their own cognitive dissonance because they're actually starting to embrace both roles and they're starting to notice that in themselves. Exactly. It's like, like a, so the victim is, is moving a little bit towards the, the, the stomach yep. center. Getting uh, a taste of that power. Of power, which allows to validate himself. And the other one getting a little bit of taste of the heart power and getting a line of self. Yep. So this is the line. They're starting to get that line. But then the brain goes, oh my God, this is wrong. Stop. And it starts to cut them off. Okay. <laughs> or they start cutting each other off, right? So they're dropping in a dream a little bit, getting a taste of each other's center, but then coming back to game and saying, whoa, stop, can't do that, right? And so they're toggling game, dream, game, dream, game, dream, right? And so with what's going to get us into the reconciliation is to drop more and more into acceptance and the resilience to accept, okay? Accept that I'm borrowing from persecutor. Accept that I'm borrowing from victim. Okay, and have the resilience to start letting go of clinging to one role or another. Okay, and that helps me drop. So in part two, that's what I'm gonna show you, okay? And when you so, drop, you cut the circle? As we, each time we're dropping, we're, we're also unclinging a little bit more. And then the identity starts crumbling a little bit more until it, we're, we're actually really unhooking and untangling and dissolving ourselves.